Good evening, everybody. Uh, for my project, I wanted to look at high-tech biomedical implants. These are becoming increasingly complex. So we have implants under development with integrated chips and computers. Um, they require power sources. They have specialized software. They perform increasingly complex tasks like regulating or even modifying brain activity. And when people talk about these complex implants, most of the time um, it's about the technology itself and the way individuals might use it. But I wanted to look more broadly at the structures in place that dictate how implants are developed and how they're disseminated into society and into patients. Unfortunately, I found a lot of ethical problems, both in implant industries that have been around for decades and with new companies developing novel implants. There are especially heightened ethical problems in the implant startup world um, because these companies have a tendency to run out of money and go to business and they leave their technology that's now obsolete behind in patients. Uh, I was just gonna go into the technology a little bit. Um, some complex implants have been around for years like pacemakers and cochlear implants. Um, pacemakers were the first implanted electrical device that came out in the 1950s, so we do have some decades of experience with complex implants. Brain implants and brain computer interfaces, thank you, um, are getting a lot of attention now. They're much newer. Um, you may have heard of Neuralink. That's a big one that comes up in the news all the time. They're developing a brain computer interface that gets set into the skull. Um, the graphic on screen is of a the technology of a company called Synchron. Um, they implant a neural mesh, uh, or sorry, an electrode mesh into a vein in the brain. So that's how they get signals from the brain, but they don't require brain surgery. So there's lots of different approaches here. There's a lot going on, um, but they're you know pretty high tech, um, some might say sci-fi type devices being actually put in patients. The Synchron's device has been put in several people in early feasibility studies and they're enrolling people in clinical trials now. Bionic limbs are another example of um, some of these complex systems. Um, implants have been used to make robotic prosthetic limbs that patients can control. Uh, one case study I wanted to share with you is the story of a company called Second Sight and their Argus implants, or maybe more importantly, the story of what happened to Second Sight's patients. So Second Sight was a company developing a device system to restore some crude form of vision to blind people. Um, if you look at the screen, you can see it was a complex system. There was a camera that was mounted on a set of glasses. The camera sends video to a video processing unit typically worn at the patient's waist. The VPU sends converted images to a transmitter back in the glasses. And the transmitter sends the images to an antenna located on the outside of the eye, which sends them to an electrode array attached to the patient's retina inside of the eye. The electrodes stimulate the retina and the user experiences this as low resolution flashes of light that correspond to the video feed. Patients' experience here varied. Some strained to make up basic shapes, didn't really like it, didn't work well for them, but others had immense success. They were able to perform activities like seeing and archery, for example, and eventually about 350 people had these implants put in their bodies. To make a very, very long story short, Second Sight had financial problems. Uh, the company leadership didn't think they could make Argus implants profitable. The company started laying off employees, auctioning off company assets, and they basically went dark patient and uh, provider support completely vanished. Eventually, Second Sight was purchased by another company, but Argus patients were completely abandoned. Second Sight went from promising them improvements like new technology, software updates, maybe even color vision someday, to absolutely no support. There was no one to call if a device malfunctioned, no one to fix it, uh, no one who could give anyone information about their devices. So patients were put in a really horrible position. We do have some of their stories, for example, one patient, um, his VPU fell off his belt and shattered, so he had no vision anymore. Uh, he had to crowdsource from the implant community until he could find parts um, that he could retrofit back into his system and get vision back. Uh, another patient needed an MRI to look for a possible brainstem tumor, uh, but because MRIs can inter, or rather the implant can interfere with MRIs, um, Second Sight had told providers, don't do any scans unless you talk to us first but no one at Second Sight would pick up the phone. There was no one to talk to, no one would return calls. So the patient couldn't get an MRI. They just, they still never got one. 
So the technology is now in the eyeballs of several hundred people across the world, and Second Sight, the company, no longer exists. Um, that said, a new company was formed when Second Sight was sold. They've been receiving grant money to develop Second Sight's other technology, which is a brain implant. So I guess somebody thinks that might be profitable. So this story and some others led me to ask these questions. What duties do implant developers owe their patients? How long do these duties last? And how can implant developers fulfill their duties to patients? So I argue that implant companies have a broad duty to provide information and support to their patients. And that duty doesn't end when a clinical trial ends or when the company runs out of money. It lasts at least as long as patients live, at least as long as that technology is impacting their lives and well-being. And as far as fulfilling the duties to patients, I had a lot of ideas. <laughs> uh, we won't be able to go in depth into all of them today, but I'll, this is an overview. Um, patient access to information is really important here. The second site uh, example showed how patients can have real problems when there's no one to talk to and they don't have enough information about their devices. Um, once implanted, these devices become part of the patient's body. They can be crucial and functional parts. Um, the patient's right to information is cognizable under the already existing patient right to medical records. And there are some issues with information access that would likely be raised, especially by industry. So one category of issues are really business concerns. Companies are gonna be very concerned about IP protection, um, but there's also safety issues here. So, you know, some people have argued this information should just be open source and there's certainly reasons to argue that, but there are real safety concerns. For example, if source code is public, you might increase the risk of device hacking. Um, you might also have well-meaning but inadequately trained techs trying to fix code malfunctions in implants and then making a problem worse or making a problem where there wasn't one. So one suggestion I had was a technology escrow system. So basically companies would deposit broad information about their devices in escrow that would be managed by a third party. And that would maintain their IP protection because all of that information would be locked away, but it would be locked away for the benefits of patients and providers. So if the company was suddenly unwilling or unable to provide that information, the patient or provider could go to the escrow agent and have access. Um, there's also issues with uh, the physical part. So it's not just information people need. You might have all the plans, all of the schematics for a device, but you that doesn't mean you can, an individual patient could go find a manufacturer who could make a repair part for their very unique medical grade application. So parts are really important and the physical device itself is important. Um, I discussed making some sort of part bank, maybe part of technology escrow that would also have physical parts and tooling. Um, Standardization is a another idea. Um, we've seen standardization in the pacemaker industry. So um, back in the day when pacemakers were new, anytime you needed a new pacemaker, you had to get the leads replaced as well. And those are the wires that go from the pulse generator to the heart. And replacing those is pretty dangerous and putting new ones in is dangerous and leaving them behind is dangerous. So um, eventually providers really pushed back against industry and told them they needed to do something. And industry voluntarily standardized leads and connectors. So now if you need a new pacemaker, you don't need new leads. You can even switch brands and they should be mutually compatible. So standardization is a great idea. Um, maybe not super applicable to very, very new devices because you do, you do need um, enough time for innovation to find good solutions. So you don't wanna to standardize too soon and then maybe not have an optimal system, but if vol but voluntarily looking for opportunities to do that um, should be a goal of industry. Designing with the future in mind is really there to uh, represent a lot of ideas. So removability, upgradability, um, most people wouldn't want to sell from, from 10 years ago, and we can expect that device technology will move forward rapidly. So being able to upgrade patients to a new device easily is important. Um, and having them, if possible, be able to be removed easily would also be great. Um, Patient-centric design is also important. So, you know, maybe if you're designing a device that needs a battery, maybe there's a really high specialty battery that would be perfect in your engineering design, but maybe it's not available everywhere. 
And there's another battery that's really broadly available, but it's not as sleek and perfect in your design. Maybe you should, instead of choosing the one that's engineeringly perfect, um, pick one that patients can actually access and replace. Um, so ideas like that. Um, the right to repair is a movement that's been active in the consumer product space for a long time. Their philosophy is that once you purchase a product, you should be able to repair it. Um, and they fight against manufacturer practices that prevent customer repair. And they're really the reason why you can do things like bring your car into an independent car mechanic and get it repaired instead of having to go to a dealership. Um, the right to repair hasn't been applied so much in the medical space. They're starting to think about it for medical equipment, especially during COVID when things were breaking down and people couldn't repair them. Um, but that philosophy can be applied to the implant space as well. And the last thing on their industry representatives and conflicts of interest in clinical care, um, that we have a sort of ethical dilemma in the implant industry today with things like pacemakers and orthopedic devices where industry representatives are really common in the clinical environment. Um, and there's some confusion among patients of who they are and why they're there. Some people think they're part of their clinical care team, but they work for the company and they usually make commission based on what they sell. So anything a surgeon might touch in surgery is sales for that, for that person who's there in surgery. Um, so there's a lot of ethical issues here, and I had some ideas on ways we could address them because I'm concerned if we don't address them now with things like pacemakers, which we've been using for decades, those systems are going to be replicated with higher tech implants as well and could create even more problems. So if anyone has questions about that, I can talk more, but in the interest of time, thank you very much. <laughs>